Oh yeah, I believe it's. Okay, so cell phone says it is now 411, and uh, we are ready to begin. So I'm, I'm uh, Andy C, and uh, it is my pleasure to introduce today's seminar speaker, our store lecturer, Professor John McNamara. There he is. Mm -hmm. Wave to the crowd there. Mm -hmm. And uh, for, I'll give you a little bit of his history that uh, uh, he got his undergrad degree, his bachelor's at Oxford in math. Uh, that is, uh, the, he was the, uh, won the first and junior mathematics prize. Mm. And then he went on to get his PhD also at Oxford where the thesis title was Stability of the Inner Horizon of the Reasoner, Nordstrom, and Kerr Black Hole Models. Okay, and so that's kind of interesting and maybe a little different for this crowd, maybe not what you were expecting. Uh, it does turn out his advisor was Roger Penrose, you know, one of the major physicists, mathematicians, and I guess philosophy of science uh, people of our time. Uh, but sometime after that, he realized that rather than uh, spend the rest of his life in outer space, I guess, he was going to move down to Earth and study biology and math. And for that, he also recognized quickly that rather than only uh, celebrate the appreciation of beautiful mathematics, that it was actually important to relate it to the biology and try to actually talk to and understand biologists and sort of get at what was going to have major biological insight. And so if you look at his web of science uh, citations now, you find dozens of papers that have been cited a hundred or more times. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to sort of ramble out some of the broad range of topics that have been papers of his that have been cited a hundred or more times. And I'll, I'm going to try to keep this under half an hour, but, uh, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's a very impressive list of sort of the major issues in behavioral and evolutionary ecology. I think John is recognized as the major person bringing state dependence, just sort of energy reserves and condition and its feedbacks with behavior into the field, how it affects foraging, foraging anti-predator trade-offs, life histories, plasticity, and actually most recently how it might have insights for obesity patterns. Uh, he's also been a major figure in information and how we use information in an evolutionary framework. So things about cognition and memory. And most recently also this fascinating work on how genes are basically a source of information. So that if you want to get a sense of what you should do, uh, what is a predictor of your environment, it could be partially your experiences, partially the experiences of your parents, all as information for you, but your genes are basically in the end information and that you use these different sources of information and he's pioneering new insights on sort of genetics and phenotypic plasticity and so on from that framework. Uh, he's also done sort of you know, important work as judged by you know, heavily cited in various aspects of social behavior, sexual selection, cooperation. He's done important work on sort of evolution of personalities and overarching all of that has been his attempt to combine the functional view with proximate mechanisms. Uh, with sort of what, you know, why, at, a, at that sort of uh, physiological sense perhaps, why do they do it the way they do? What are, you know, how does that relate? Uh, a couple of, some of his awards, he was, a, he is a fellow of the Royal Society. He basically won the major prize that the Behavioral Ecology Society gives out as well as the Animal Behavior, so or the British Animal Behavior Society gives out. And a couple of years ago he won the Weldon Memorial Prize, uh, which I looked up is given by or it's given for uh, without regard to nationality or which university you're at, uh, it's given to the most noteworthy contributions in the development of mathematical or statistical methods in the previous decade before, in this case, 2014, in any aspect of biology. So I guess, you know, mathematical biology, not just behavior or evolutionary ecology, has uh, anointed him as, as one, of their, one, of their, one of their gods. So without more to say, How's that for a build-up? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, John McNamara. Thank you. Um, unlike Andy, I'd have given a very short introduction. I've, that's <laughs> just the difference in our natures. So, um, it's very nice to be here. Very nice to be in Davis as well. I have fond memories of visiting it before. It's not sunny though, which it was 100 degrees last time I was here. And I, it feels too much like England. Anyway, um, evolutionary game theory. It's, um, 
We're concerned when there are frequency dependent effects so that the fitness of an individual or fitness of a strategy depends on the, uh, the, the other strategies that are adopted within the population. And um, typically game theory models don't follow the change in G frequencies. They look actually, in the simplest case at least, for the stable endpoints of the process of evolution by natural selection. And um, these stable endpoints, evolutionary stable strategies, Nash equilibrium, whatever you call, care to call them, um, th have th this approach of doing that has revealed certain general principles. For example, um, one of the first, Menard Smith, when will contests be settled by ritualized display rather than by always fighting? Um, how is the conflict of interest between parents over care of their common young resolved? Um, I'll show you why there's a conflict of interest in a moment, although it may be fairly obvious to you. Um, when does cooperation evolve, etc.? So let me go give you an example, which is this two parents caring for their common young. This is the standard model. It's quite old. Um, typically, the way people have modeled it, they've thought that the two parents looking after their young, there's a common benefit, which are the young themselves. And if X and Y, the efforts, say, of the female and the male, then the survival of the young may be as some increasing but decelerating function of the sum of the parental efforts. Let's assume that in the simplest case. The thing about effort, though, it's typically costly because in order to care for the young, you have to guard them against, say, intruders. You may have to go and get food, which may have a predation risk and also uses a lot of energy, risks injury, and so on. So there's some cost to the parent, which, let's say, increases an accelerating rate with the effort put in. And the, there's a conflict of interest. Because this benefit function is common to both young, to both parents, sorry, but the cost is paid individually. So each parent, not surprisingly, wants the young to do well, but would prefer the other parent to put in the effort, of course. So that's why there's a conflict of interest. OK, so standard theory, how is this resolved? Paper, quite old by now. It's assumed that efforts are genetically determined. Their paper doesn't say this, but it's implicit in it, although they didn't realize that at the time. OK, so. Female effort here, and what I've plotted is the best effort to the male for given fixed effort to the female. All right. You can also plot the best effort to the female for fixed effort to the male. And the Houston Davis solution is to assume that each of the parents is doing the best given the effort of the other. So that is, you predict these are the, eff the predicted effort of the female and male, and they are in what's called Nash equilibrium, because each is doing the best given the other. So this is the standard resolution. Okay. However, you should realize, of course, this is not a cooperative solution. And what I've plotted here is actually, below this line, this is actually for a case where the costs of the male and female are slightly different, but Below this line is the set of all possible pay combinations of payoff to the female and payoff to the male as you vary efforts. Okay? So the Nash equilibrium lies somewhere, let's say, there, in the middle of it, for this particular example. And you can see that actually both parents could do better in terms of their payoff if they lay up here. But that won't happen. Evolution will not take you there. It takes you to here. So it's not a cooperative solution. Because the two parents, each of them, want the other to put in the effort, it doesn't work out to be efficient for the two of them. So one of the themes will be, I, I'm interested in how one might modify standard games, what's realistic about them, what isn't. So one of the themes will be, if you make these modifications, does that increase the level of cooperation or decrease it? For example, I will modify this to the parental effort game and we'll see whether you move more this way or actually it gets worse. Right. Now, of course, all models are wrong. We all know this, but in George Box's famous quote, 
some are useful. Okay. Um, and I'm not saying that these previous models we've had in game theory have not been useful. But I think that quite often people haven't realized their limitations. And it's worth looking at the assumptions behind many of these games and thinking about what, these, what are the consequences of these assumptions. So, for example, it's typical to assume all individuals are the same or all individuals in a role are the same. So, for example, in the parental effort game, it's, it was assumed that all males are the same and all females are the same in their abilities to care. Okay? Um, process. You notice that each was doing the best effort given the other, but there was no sense that the parents were observing one another or interacting. Okay? Something odd there. There are lots of other things which are, I could complain about the way we do game theory, but one of them is that typically we think in one-dimensional traits. In turn, in the parental effort, you think of it as an effort. Actually, even in the parental effort case, there typically is more than one thing. There's getting food, there's defending the nest for if you're a bird, and so on. How does that change things? This remark about ecological context may be a bit obscure, but it's typical to assume that there's some payoffs in these games. What are these? Where do they come from? What do they mean? Okay. Well, actually, for many questions, you actually cannot specify the payoffs in advance. You have to put it in an ecological context, you solve the game, and if you like, you can reinterpret the results in terms of certain payoffs. And that's a quite, that, I won't have time to say anything on that, but it's about being self-consistent within the model. And many of these models are really not self-consistent at the level of the population. And finally, it's usually assumed that, as in much of behavioral ecology, that optimal behavior is possible, and there aren't really limits to that. And yet, of course, we know that animals are not optimal, and they're not, in particular, infinitely flexible in what they do. Right, so let me go back to the parental care case. Um, this is the Houston Davis solution. Now, what are the assumptions behind this? Well, it's assumed that, as I said, all males are the same and all females are the same. It's assumed that the choice of effort is made before the, part, the choice of effort by the partner is known. And then, the efforts are not altered. In other words, efforts are fixed. It's like a, what's called a sealed envelope bid. It's like, I pull out an envelope, say what I'm going to do, and I do it whatever my partner's doing. Okay? Um, so, really, efforts in this case are hardwired by evolution. They're, e they're genetically determined. Now, this sounds a little odd, but there's a perverse logic because all males are the same and all females are the same, and in evolutionary stability, all males are putting in one particular effort, and the females are adapted to that, so there's no need for the females to observe the male. Okay? It's a very perverse logic, of course, because in real populations, there is, of course, variation. There always is. And then you expect the female to observe what the male's doing, the males to observe what the female's doing. And then you expect them to, if you like, negotiate the amount of care by responding to each other. So you should be thinking not in terms of efforts being genetically determined, but the rules by which you negotiate efforts are the things which are genetically determined. And what we expect is that you, you have an evolutionary stable pair of rules, one for males and one for females, each of which is the best rule given the rule of the other. So this is a different perspective than looking at efforts, and it predicts different levels of care. Let me say, um, the first thing is, how would one, it's, th this is actually quite a difficult problem to solve in general, but the way some people thought of it was as follows. They thought, well, Maybe the best thing to do is for a, an individual is to always adjust your effort in real time to be the best given what your partner uh, does. That seems reasonable. 
or it seemed reasonable to the people who wrote about this. For example, this is in the standard behavioral ecology textbooks, Krebs and Davis, for example. That, that is really what the Houston Davis solution is about. It's about real-time responding. The trouble is you shouldn't believe everything you read because this is not evolutionary stable. If individuals just change their effort to be the best given their partner, their partner will exploit them. You can just reduce their effort, making you increase your effort. They do better, you do worse. Very simple. It's not evolutionary stable. Not easy to find evolutionary stable rules, but you can find it analytically in a very simple, for a very simple payoff structure. And that's what I did long ago, um, sorry, um, with Kathy Gass and Alistair Houston. And what you discover for these stable negotiation rules is you can look at two individuals following these rules and you can see the effort which they negotiate. Now the rule, each rule is the best given the rule of the partner, but the efforts they negotiate are not the best given the effort of the partner. So you're at a different solution. It is not the Houston Davis solution. Um, in fact, young get less care than predicted by Houston Davis. They're less cooperative still if they respond in real time to one another. And actually, you can be an extreme case where the young may get less care if they're two parents than if they're a one, because each of them is trying to, neg to negotiate the other to put in the effort. Um, and you can see this here. This is, if you like, the, this is a, a parameter in the model, which you measures, the, if you like, the degree of conflict between the parents. This is the amount of um, care the young get if they have one parent alone. Uh, this is the Houston Davis solution, the total care by both parents under the Houston Davis solution. This is under the negotiated settlement. And you can see it's actually lower in some cases. Of course, what would happen if that was really the case is one of the parents would desert, because then the young would do better and the parent who deserted wouldn't have to pay the cost. So each of them would vie to be the first to desert, in fact, in that case. Okay, so the thing is, the moral of this is individual differences select, which are typically not in models, select for a response to partner during an interaction. Differences, um, they not only select for a need to respond, but they can change the outcome of what's going on. And this applies to many games in behavioral ecology. Um, so, for example, um, there's a predator inspection game, which is well known to many people in the field. And in this, two fish approach a suspicious-looking object uh, to see whether it is a pike, let's say. And these fish approach it, and... Um, the way Parker and Malinsky modeled this was to say the distance each of the fish approach was the best given how far their partner had advanced. Okay? Now, actually, it's just like the Houston Davis model. It only makes sense if you assume these distances are genetically determined and individuals aren't responding to one another, which is clearly nonsense. So this applies to, if you like, most of the games that, or many of the games that behavioral ecologists deal with. Okay. Now, um, I said that uh, many things are more than one-dimensional, so let again think about that with respect to parental care. Um, a recent paper by uh, Zoltan Bartra and others um, shows that if you uh, go... You can get more cooperation if you assume that instead of, as I said, just providing food, let's say, you consider food and territorial defense. What tends to happen is a division of labor occurs, and under this, the amount of cooperation between the parents is greater and the young do better than if there is just a single measure of effort. Um, What I want to do instead of looking at that is to look at a simple model where I'm thinking of the coevolution of the amount of care you've put in 
and the ability to care. So I'm thinking here that you're evolving two things. One is a behavioral trait, which is the amount of care, and the other is a physiological trait, typically, which enhances your ability to care. So the classic one in mammals is mammary glands. They enhance the ability to care. Okay? You might ask, well, one question is to ask, why don't males also have mammary glands, functioning mammary glands, as well as females? Okay? Um. Okay, let's go back to the Houston David solution. Um, within this model, the, here's our solution again, here's the best responses, and they cross the best response of the, uh, oh, I've switched them around, this is the best response of the female to the male effort, this is the best response of the male to the female effort, here's where they intersect, they intersect at one point, okay, so there's only one Nash equilibrium, and at that point, if the costs are the same for both parents, then you get equal care by both parents. And this situation is entirely stable. And you can see that sort of intuitively because, for example, if, um, if male effort was here, then the best thing for females to do would be to come up here, which means the best thing for males to do would be here, and you go up and up and up, and you get to that. Well, um, that's not an evolutionary model, but you can see that it will be stable. And what the, the important thing here is that the slopes of these lines, they cross in this way because the, these costs are accelerating, which seems quite reasonable in most situations. And this is a case, this is where I've done an evolutionary simulation, um, e evolving the amount of care by two parents, and they evolved to be roughly equal. Um, Let's think of a model in which we co-evolve effort with the ability to care. So now, I'm, and each individual is characterized by its effort and its ability to care, and the common benefit is the same as before, but there are two costs of care. One is the, the cost of actually doing the care. And the more able an individual is, the less cost is paid by that individual for a given level of effort. But there's a second cost, which is the cost of maintaining the machinery to be able to have this ability, the cost of maintaining mammary glands, let's say. So that's this thing here. Okay. Now, here is a, a, an illustration of what you might have. So here is this, this guy or individual, male or female, I'm not specifying, has low ability to care, and then hence the costs of effort increase very rapidly with effort. On the other hand, this individual with a black line here has higher ability to care, and as effort increases, the costs increase less rapidly. All of these costs are accelerating, though, as well as increasing. However, you, if you co-evolve the parental effort and the ability to care, you might expect that the ability to care is the best given the effort you're going to put in. And that means that for a given effort, your theta variable, your ability, will evolve to reduce the cost. And so, this is the effective cost of care once you take that <coughs> into account. And the model becomes formally equivalent to what we had before, where the benefit is before, but the new cost, this effective cost, is this curved line here. And the important thing about this curved line, it's decelerating, the envelope curve. What are the consequences of that? Here's the Houston Davis solution. When you've got a decelerating one, can't, you know, I'm afraid you'll have to take my word for it rather than I can't do the maths here. But when you've got a decelerating one, they cross in the opposite direction. So now what happens is that rather than just crossing once here, there are three points at which these lines cross. So there are actually three Nash equilibria, 
They're all evolutionary stable strategies. Okay? However, this one here, the symmetric one in the middle, will not evolve. And the reason is, if you do the zigzag thing, and you start near here, it'll like take you down to here. And if you start here, it'll take you up to here. It's unstable in terms of the, if you had a genetic model. Okay. So all of a sudden, we end up with, instead of equal care by both parents, one of the care parents, in this case, the female, evolves the ability to care and evolves to put in a lot of care and the other evolves to be useless at care so as not to pay the cost and doesn't put any care in. Okay. So again you get different predictions. From before we had equal care, now we have totally unequal care. And what causes this flip? Well, it's it's random in our model, because I've assumed in this model males and females are exactly the same. But if I put factors in which break the symmetry, for example, if males do not have complete certainty of paternity, this, this acts as a symmetry-breaking mechanism. And what you get with uncertainty of paternity is you get female-only care, or females doing almost all of the care. So... Going from one trait to two traits, you can get very different answers. Um, yeah. So what about reputation? As I said, one of the complaints I have about most models is they don't have differences. Of course, if you want rep think about reputation, then there has to be differences. That's what, diff that's what reputation is about. Individuals are different. So let's think of that in a simple setting where individuals meet pairwise. And when they meet, they play a little game together, which is maybe a game where each contributes to the common good of the pair, but at individual cost, let's say. They have to decide how much effort to put into the common good. Um, so what happens here? Well, if you've got differences, then you get different behaviors. Once you've got different behaviors, then you'll get reputations because individuals are systematically behaving different. Once individuals have reputations, then there'll be selection on other individuals to respond to reputations. Because if I know something about your reputation, I know something about the effort you're going to put in, and that will change what I do. Right. However, once individuals are, respond to reputations, there's a feedback because that will then lead to selection to change reputations by changing your behavior. Okay. So it's this loop which I'm going to be concerned with. What does it end up? Where does it end up in a simple model? Okay. Does particular, I want to ask the question, does the existence of reputation within a population enhance or suppress the cooperation within that population? So, I shall assume the little game they're playing when the individuals come together, there's going to be a common good, and there are individual costs. But now I want, I want some way of making the individuals different. And there are various ways you could do this. You could put in a lot of mutation. You could put in uh, migration from outside to maintain a bit of noise. But I shall do it by assuming that during development, individuals, due to random, effect, random things which happen to them, are, have different, if you like, qualities. So this individual here is a high quality individual because the cost of a given level of effort rises relatively shallowly. Whereas this individual here is a low quality individual in this population. It's not genetically determined, it's determined phenotypically during development. Right. And I shall assume that individuals play Many, many of these rounds of this game, and take my fitness measure, is going to be some increasing function of the average payoff over many rounds. Okay, let's assume that. So how am I going to model reputation? In the simplest case, it could be what partner did with, 
what, what my current partner has, my current partner's reputation could be what my current partner did with another partner in the last round. Or it could be a weighted sum of what they've done on all previous rounds, or something of the sort. In fact, in the model, I allow a range of things. Um, what effort, how is effort determined? Well, the effort of each individual in this population has some baseline effort, plus this is the V is the type of the individual. It's sort of inversely <coughs> proportional to quality, if you like. And mu is the mean type. So this is the difference between my type, if you like, how much effort should I put in? This is my baseline. This is the difference between my type and the mean type in the population. This is the difference between partner's reputation and my baseline effort. So I've coded it like this. I could have done it in other ways. Every individual has a rule of this sort, but the individuals differ in these parameters, m, delta, lambda. These are genetically determined. And what I'm interested in is the evolution of these three parameters. In fact, you can solve for the Nash equilibrium values of these three in simple cases, but I'll just show in evolutionary simulation. So here we have a population, and what I've done, I've constrained lambda, which is this response term, response to reputation, to be zero for the first 10,000 generations. In other words, I am not allowing individuals to use reputation. And you can see that the parameters settle down to some equilibrium value. After 10,000 generations, I now allow this lambda parameter to evolve away from zero. In other words, I allow individuals to respond to reputation. How do they do so? Well, the first thing that happens is that lambda evolves to be negative. Okay. Why is that? Um, well, partner's reputation is positively correlated with our effort. And since these best responses, the more effort my partner puts in, the less effort I should put in, because I've got these uh, accelerating diminishing returns on the benefit. It means that it's best to reduce my own effort if partner has a high reputation. This means lambda evolves to be negative. Okay. Now, once lambda evolves to be negative, imagine that you're going to, you're going to meet a partner. That partner's going to know something about your reputation. They have a negative lambda which means that the higher your reputation, the less effort they're going to put in with you because they expect you to compensate. So there is selection to reduce your reputation by reducing your effort. And that is what's happened here. The M, your baseline effort, comes down. And so here we can see it again. This is the mean population effort. It decreases once you allow reputation. This is the mean population fitness. It also decreases. Reputation is bad for fitness within the population. Right. Okay. You can get the opposite if your game structure is different. There are some games where it may be that the best thing for an individual to do is an in terms of effort, is an increasing function of the effort of their partner. For example, maybe in some hunting endeavor, it might be that if they don't put much effort in, it really isn't worth you doing it either. But if they start to put in a lot of effort, then it's worth you putting in more yourself. Okay. Now, if that's the case, you get the opposite result. Here we can see it, that fitness in this case increases baseline effort and increases mean population fitness. So it depends on the gain structure. And this is a novel me uh, mechanism for increasing or decreasing cooperation. I should say that cooperation, models of cooperation typically focus on um, the prisoner's dilemma. And the prisoner's dilemma is a very strange game. It's a game in which the best thing to do is to always defect, regardless of what your partner does. You don't, you know, you can have, it doesn't matter what you know about them, you just defect. That's a slightly odd game. For most real games, you would expect 
what indi an individual do in an interaction would have some relationship to what their partner's going to do, if they knew it. Right? And this mechanism relies on that, and it won't work for the prisoner's dilemma. All right. How am I doing time-wise? I haven't got a watch. Did anybody tell me? So what does that mean? I've got to... Uh, maybe, maybe. Okay. Now, another assumption of game theory is that we know that game theory, when it finds these Nash equilibria, predicts that all individuals are the same, uh, are at this Nash equilibria. But we know in reality there's mutation, there's noise going on in the system. And the question is, is it still a reasonable approximation to look at these equilibria? With these, Nash, with these Nash models which predict this Nash. And in some cases, it probably is. But I want to show you a case in which it can dramatically alter conclusions. So the Nash is when the best behavior of each, of each individual in the population, is each individual is behaving the best given the behavior of the other population members. And so let's have a look at the prisoner's dilemma, even though I've just criticized it. Um, I will, um, so in the prisoner's dilemma is about whether to cooperate with your partner or not, which is usually called defect. And this is your payoff, if you like. If you're, this is your po opponent's action and your action. If you cooperate with your partner and they cooperate, you get three. If you cooperate, they defect, you get nothing, etc. So what is the best thing for you to do? If they cooperate, the best thing for you to do is defect because five is greater than three. If they defect, the best thing for you to do is to defect because one is greater than zero. Therefore, if you don't know what your partner's going to do, you defect. Or even if you do know what they're going to do, you defect. And they, their logic is similar because they've got the same power structure. And so what you end up is the Nash equilibrium solution is to defect. And the problem with that, of course, is then that both players get a payoff of one, whereas if in some way they could have agreed to cooperate, they'd have got a higher payoff of three. And that's why it's a dilemma. And this has been used as a basis for thinking about the evolution of cooperation. Now, let's have a look at a particular scenario which involves repeatedly playing this game. Let's assume that two individuals get together um, uh, you two, I don't know if you know each other, but anyway, um, I assume you don't and you'll never see each other again because otherwise we'll have reputation effects and so on. And we'll also assume there's no audience here because that may alter what you're doing. Um, but you're going to play n rounds of this game where n might be 100, okay? Now, you're going to start off playing and provided you both cooperate, you're going to get $3 each. The moment one of you defects, the defector will get five, let's say, if the other cooperates, or one if the other defects. But the game ends at that point. And the idea is that if your partner defects, you probably walk away and find a better partner. Now, that isn't, it, that isn't explicit in this model. Later on, I'll show you a model where it is. Okay. Now, what's the... Lo the logic of this game, you both know that it's 100 rounds. So, um, we've said if either player defects, the game ends. What happens on the last round? The 100th round, you defect. It's the only sensible thing to do. Now, that means you know when you get to round 99 that you're going to get a payoff of 1 on the last round, if you ever get there. Well, that it means, actually, if you do the sums, that it isn't worth being cooperative on round 99. So you defect on round 99, which means that if you ever get to round 98, etc., etc., and you should never cooperate. So the only Nash equilibrium solution is to defect on the first round. That's what theory tells us. Okay. Now, there's something that seems a bit odd to us in that. I mean, if you were two are playing this game against each other, and it really, these really were sums of dollars, would you defect on the first round? No. Would you? No. 
And the reason is you have some intuition probably in a population that some members of the population might actually be cooperative. Okay. They're not at this Nash equilibrium. Right. So let's think about that for a moment. Let's go to a case where n equals 20. And I'm going to consider various scenarios. So this is a with increasing spread of cooperation within the population. Let's consider the case, for example, when all individuals in the population cooperate for exactly 10 rounds and then defect. What's the best thing, if I can put it that way, for you to do in that circumstance? The answer is to cooperate for nine rounds and get your defection in before they can. All right? So you, this is, you cooperate after, for nine rounds. That's what this is doing here. Now, let's have a look at a case where the mean number of rounds individual cooperate for is 10, but there's huge variation within the population. What happens now when you get to round 9? Well, if you get to round 9, first of all, you have a reasonably cooperative partner, because you've got this far. How many more rounds are they going to cooperate for? Well, the chances they're going to defect on the 10th round is relatively small, because there's this big spread. And you know there are at least nine. So, what do you do? You cooperate. And in fact, if there's enough variation, you can cooperate for many rounds beyond. And the important thing here is that when there's low variation in the population, your level of cooperation is below the mean for the population. When there's high levels of variation, your, mean, your level of cooperation is above the mean for the population. So I think people can probably see where this is going. Now, what maintains variation in a population? Well, it could be lots of things, as I said, but let's put it in by mutation, or some sort of mutation-like thing. Let's make an evolutionary model. In this evolutionary model, the trait we're going to evolve is the number of rounds to cooperate before defecting. We'll assume that the number of offspring is some constant plus the payoff from the game. And that inheritance is as follows. If a parent, it's an asexual model, if the parent cooperates for n rounds, the offspring cooperates for n minus 1, n or n plus 1, uh, bounded away from, you know, bounded at 0, etc. Where epsilon, if you like, is a sort of mutation probability. Small epsilon means that um, the offspring tends to be the same as the parent. Large epsilon means you get some spread. Now, if you do an evolutionary simulation, these are two evolutionary simulations done in the case where n equals 10. If you look at this case here, to start with, with the circles, this is the distribution of the number of rounds of cooperation in the population at stability. This is the epsilon equals 0 0.017 case. Okay? This is the modal value, 0. Individuals in this population, most of them, defect on the first round, as theory tells us. This is epsilon equals zero point zero one eight, and this is the curve now. What's happened is that there's enough variation so that the best response to the population is greater than the population mean, and the evolution just drives you to high levels of cooperation. This is a very artificial example, but I wanted to construct it to make a point, and that is, this is our stable solution in this case, is not a Nash equilibrium, and is way, very far away from the Nash equilibrium. Individuals are not doing the best, given what the others are doing. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, Time, Andy. What's the time? Oh, sorry. Okay. I think this is my last example. Um, so, the thing about variation in a population, it selects for other traits. So, for example, uh, social sensitivity, which is about reputation, if you like, is one of them. There's no point in expending effort in looking round at others in the population and finding out about them if they're all the same. Okay. 
the, more diff the bigger the differences that exist within populations, the more it's worth actually being socially sensitive. And you can exploit this in various ways. For example, um, like a trust model where there's a range of social sensitivities within the population maintain variation in trustworthiness. And the variation in trustworthiness maintains the range of social sensitivities. Okay. So there you don't need mutation to maintain um, variation. It maintains itself by this mechanism. Um, there are other things. There's, um, for example, uh, Rufus Johnson and others. Their eavesdropping model is about social sensitivity. What they've, in their model, variability and consistency leads to what's called eavesdropping by some individuals. In other words, they pay the cost of actually looking at what others are doing. And then eavesdroppers maintain the need for individuals in the population to be consistent in what they do. I want to look at a second trait rather than social sensitivity which co-evolves with individual difference, which co-evolves with whatever trait you're concerned with when there are individual differences. And that is about how choosy you are. So, again, if we can think about whether you should be choosy about your partner, variation in the population is crucial. If there is no variation, there is no point in you being choosy. You might as well as choose a randomly selected partner. That's all there is. So, Let's examine this by looking at a population where each population member breeds annually till it dies. At the beginning of each year, there's a pool of individuals which are single. They pair up at random, and they're joined by others who have to remain together from last year as pairs, and they play a game. And the game is to get some sort of resources, and the resources are then converted into reproductive success. Again, this could be an asexual model, although you could, uh, this is how we modeled it, you could do this with males and females, but we didn't do that. Um, now, what happens is then, after that, individuals decide whether to divorce their partner or not. Okay? And individuals that, um, so if you think about who's going to be single at the beginning of next year, it's going to be, Individuals who have divorced their partner, individuals who have been divorced by their partner, individuals whose partner has died, and any offspring they've produced. Okay? Others, if there's no divorce or death, then you, they go forward as a pair. They maintain their bond. Okay. And I should say, I said there's death. Um, it's important there's some sort of mortality going on here so these individuals don't live forever. Okay. And that's going to play a critical role. Okay, so let's think of an evolutionary model. We have two traits. Trait one is going to be genetically determined. It's the effort in this game. Again, it's a game, if you like, where there's some common good. Um, trait two is how choosy you are about your partner. So it's a divorce threshold. It's a number which says, if my partner's effort is below this, I will divorce them and seek a new partner next year. If it's above this, I will try and retain my partner. And the pair only stay together if both individuals want to stay together. Otherwise, the pair splits up. Why do you divorce? Why might you divorce? To find a better partner, of course. But there's a, there's a risk in doing this. It could be actually do, you know, costs of actually search for a new partner, but it could also, the p point is that you, you're choosing another partner from this pool of single individuals. But the single individuals, on average, are the ones which have been divorced, or there's a higher proportion of them than those that are, of course, still in pairs. And they're the ones that are uncooperative. So you're, you're typically going to end up with an uncooperative partner who will you'll divorce again and so on. So, um, here's what happens when I evolve this for a particular game where there's a common good. Here's, these are two traits I've plotted here. And this is the effort you put into the common good, and here's the Nash equilibrium effort, and here's the cooperative, and they're very different. Okay. Here's how choosy you are about partner. Okay. And I've plotted, these are contour plots, if you like, of frequencies, 
for three different mortalities within the population at stability when I've run it forward for a, a long time. The first thing to note is that choosiness selects for cooperation because individuals don't want to be divorced. If you, I can put it like that. So the more choosy individuals are in the population, the more cooperative, more cooperation will evolve in that population because there's a benefit from not being divorced. Okay? So, these two things co-evolve together. And if you think about how choosy you should be, if you live only for two years, which is high mortality rate, there is no point about being choosy about your partner. You just stick with whatever you've got. In which case, everybody evolves to put in this Nash high, very low level of effort, the Nash equilibrium effort. On the other hand, if you live for 100 years, then it's worth being choosy about your partner. Because once you find a partner which is, matches your needs and they match, you match theirs, then you get high levels of cooperation, which you can you get a lot of offspring over many years. So it's really worth being choosy. Okay. So that's why you get higher levels of cooperation and choosiness when you live longer. It depends on, on lifespan, but it also depends on the mutation rate for obvious reasons that, as I said, You've got more variation with high mutation rate, which means that you should be more choosy. So there's more to choose from, if you like. Okay. Um, and you can do a similar thing with the prisoner's dilemma. So this is a continuous version of the prisoner's dilemma. And in this, here I've looked at individuals which are living for, um, this is 20 years, and they're totally um, uncooperative. And these are individual, this is a population where individuals live for 40 years and they're totally cooperative. Okay. And actually the flip is sudden as you vary lifespan. And the flip is also sudden as you vary mutation rate. Right. Okay. Well, I'd better stop. Um, I've been talking about some of these things. Um, I haven't uh, had a chance to go into... Um, ecological context, and I haven't said anything about mechanism, but um, one of the things about mechanism, it seems to me, is that animals are not, in models, it's typical to assume that individuals are totally unflexible or they're completely flexible. Actually, neither is true. And in fact, of course, when you get to know somebody, it's clear they're not flexible because you can predict something about what they're going to do in the future from what you've learned about them in the past. They're not completely flexible, but they're not totally inflexible either. And somehow game theory needs to get to grips with situations like that, and it, it doesn't seem to have attempted to do that. And so that's certainly one direction in which um, I think it should be going. But, I mean, there are others as well, but including things which are to do with um, for example, there's very little learning in game theory. There's some, but we should be thinking of learning and development within it. We should be thinking of the fact that individuals are not adapted to play typically a single game, although there's some games like within mating, which occurs maybe just once, etc. very important things. They may, if you like, be adapted to that, but actually many of the games that individuals play within life are varied, and they need, they need a general mechanism to deal with all of these things. They're not going to play the Nash equilibrium for every game they come up with. They're just going to have something which behaves, which a rule which performs well on average. And again, that has hardly been addressed. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say. Thank you. Good. Yeah. Alan. So you had a couple of examples where you, if you change something, you had a sudden flip. Yeah. Yeah. So it would seem that, relaxing some other assumptions, you should be able to get cases where the outcome depends on the initial conditions. Does 
thinking of this as a yeah. bifurcation, otherwise it seems odd. Um, in the particular examples I had, there's only typically, well, it depends. For some of them, there was more than one Nash equilibrium, let's say. And um, in those examples, it does matter, like with the parental uh, co-evolution of care and ability to care. Where you end up depends where you start very much. But in the things like the repeated prisoner's dilemma, when I first introduced that, you know, there's only there, it actually doesn't really seem to matter where you start, in fact. You've got, because you've got this mutation going on, which generates this variation, and then it's that, once the, you know, wherever you start, you can start with all individuals the same or whatever it is, the variation gets to be enough to force cooperation in the population. It seems, though, that some other thing that's being assumed, because certain flips just seem to be a special, depend on some constraints of some sort. Yeah, I, I, they might be. I mean, of course, in any mo model, there's a lot of noise, if you see what I mean. But, I mean, it does suggest, you know, with, it, with the last model, I had this sudden flip as you increase lifespan. Of course, there's a lot of other things going on in the real world, and you wouldn't expect that. Because as you increase lifespan, you change, going across different species, you typically change lots of other things as well. But, but what it does identify is that there's a force, if you like, is different if you're short-lived or if you're long-lived. So, I think that's all I'd say. In your last example, I'm trying to work out the predictions uh, from it. So yeah. uh, would it be possible to look across species at uh, longevity and then predict how elaborate mate choice would be or how yeah. ornamented yeah. 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 Um, species would be in relation to mate choice? Can, can you help yeah. me through that? Yeah, well, I've, I've actually done explicit models of mate choice before, but I'm, you know, I'm motivated by the fact that long-lived bird species, for example, tend to have partners for life, whereas short-lived don't. There's a tendency that way. Um, and, um, but I do see it, I mean, it's funny being a modeler because you're in this very artificial world where you're trying to expose the logic of something. And what that model does is saying, if you change this one parameter, which is how long individuals live, this is, the ch this is what I predict. But the problem is when you're going across species, is you're changing everything, including why are they living longer. You're probably changing something in the environment or something else, which, et cetera. So then it's less clear what you're going to predict. You might, other th you're, all you're saying is other things being equal, this is what I predict. that it, it isn't just that uh, uh, one individual evaluates another individual. They, they will uh, evaluate often the, uh, the, the whole population that they're in. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've, I'm in with a lot of cooperators, so my chances are good mm -hmm. if I cooperate. Yep, yep. And, uh, yep. and I, it seems like I mean, a, a realistic yeah, example yeah, of that yeah. is right here at yeah. UC Davis. The students yeah, yeah. are highly cooperative sure, in, in sure. a public good sure. state. Uh, sure. And uh, yeah. so, so... Yeah, I, I, I agree. And so this goes back partly to what we were saying about learning, which is in very few of these games, that in fact in many situations you will learn over time that in your local environment that individuals are fairly cooperative. That will then change your behavior and may lead to, to bootstrap up the levels of cooperation. So actually I've been doing this in real, t you know, in evolutionary time in that your individuals aren't flexible over their life. They just have a given level of how cooperative they are. But I'm sure we are pretty flexible and we will learn about our local environment and respond to it. So, so yes, you're quite right. Andy. So in uh, uh, quite a few of your games <coughs> that have uh, cooperation and conflict in there, uh, in essence, you, you can punish the other individual by actually not giving them much stuff yeah, or, yeah. you know, by lowering your effort. Yeah. Uh, but uh, there's also stuff where you just can directly punish them or someone else can punish them as a yeah, classic yeah. thing that would actually uh, induce cooperation. Sure. 
Is that actually fundamentally different? Like, would you model that totally differently, or is, or is that, you know, is yeah, that? A, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it would. I think it would because, I mean, you know, if you think about cooperation, uh, a punishment in, yeah. in many of these models, why, why would you? If it costs you to punish, yeah. that's that's the yeah. thing. Why would you do that, right. unless, uh, you know, there are future benefits from it or something of the sort? Do you know? Uh, or unless, um, uh, uh, you know, the question, I mean, it may be yeah. that there's a social norm that unless you punish this person, that other, other people will punish you. Or it may be other people, explo uh, other, other people exploit yeah. you or something of the sort. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? So I, I do think it has been rather different. function would be very different <coughs> if instead of maximizing the mean, you'll actually try to minimize the variance. For instance, in the parents cooperating. Yeah. So yeah, you could increase your fitness by have, giving more average yeah. or yeah. more food on average to yeah. the offspring. Mm. But if for three days you won't give him food, he will die and it will yeah. be zero. Sure. So sure. you can get sure. a really different prediction. There. No, I agree. I agree. So again, we're approaching more realistic things here. Do you know what I mean? But. Uh, um, uh, I mean, I haven't done anything on, if you like, consistent behavior, but, but that might be one thing where um, individuals choose their partner on, for example. Yeah. So, yes. Yeah, even if all individuals are the same, yeah. just, if the benefit is not maximizing the average, it's yeah. minimizing the variance, basically bedheading. Sure, sure. I mean, there's no variation in here in terms of uh, over time. In fact, there's nothing happening you know, as a, a time process, but it's quite possible that you you choose partners on the basis of, of their consistency in behavior as one of, one of the criteria. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In the, the last game about divorce, if I, if I understood it right, um, one of the reasons you want to stick with your partner, particularly if you're, if you're so long in the species, mm -hmm. is because you don't want to end up with this terrible pool of divorcees mm -hmm. in the next year. Yeah. But isn't it, I, I must be misunderstanding something because the divorce is driven by a difference in cooperation between the pair in the previous year. So the divorce, the one who's divorced is obviously a relatively low cooperation. Yeah. But the one who does the, the divorcing, divorcing could be high. Is, right. So if could be high. No, I agree. I agree. But, it, but actually, if you, if you look at what happens within these models, if you look at them, it's true, but on average, the level of cooperativeness amongst the single individuals is always less than amongst those individuals which have remained, uh, the average in the population. Okay, if there are no other questions, let's, let's give Dr. Maxmeyer another round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. And just a final note is he is here for another week. So he's here collaborating with a bunch of us on various models. So he's in town for another week, and uh, if any of you would like to make an appointment, uh, it's almost certain that sometime next week uh, you get a chance to chat with him, maybe get him to model something with you. All right, thank you.